Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Quebec calls for military help as punishing floods push people to the limit. We haven't been able to, to sleep, to be honest. Is it stressful? Very stressful. We'll explain the washout in central Canada and tell you who's next in line. Rescue in Yukon. Dramatic images show the moment of truth. Plus, Ottawa plans how to fire back at U.S. trade measures. What's the connection to the B.C. election? Disastrous flooding throughout central Canada is unrelenting. An overwhelmed Quebec has asked the military for help. Ontarians in the capital region are getting hammered just like their neighbours and a drenched Toronto prepared in case it might become the next victim of a massive weather system. It's churning slowly eastward, dumping incredible amounts of rain. Homes have been ruined, roads have been cut, and people are frustrated and exhausted. Tonight, we have extensive coverage from three affected areas. Judy Trin will have the latest from the capital region. Havard Gould looks at Toronto's preparations. But we begin with Alison Northcott and the misery in Quebec. For nearly two weeks, Robert Doucette has been trying to keep the water away from his daughter's house. When he looks around, it seems like a losing battle. Disaster. <laughs> A disaster. I mean, most people left. A couple of them are high enough that they're okay, and they decided to stay. But uh, most of them, are, they, they left. About 50 homes on this island on the west side of Montreal are cut off due to flooding. Water levels rose quickly, and the stress is mounting too. Marvin Salito says the city hasn't done enough to help. Especially when we have a family there, we have a, you know, have a newborn, so it's very stressful because we're trying to save the house and try, try to save where we live, right? Uh, everybody was waiting for St. Meg all day, and now we're, our, our house is going to get ruined because we're not prepared. This bridge is the only way on or off the island, and some people have been walking across, trudging through the fast-moving water to get to their homes. It's already a dangerous situation, and there are concerns it's going to get worse. The city is urging residents on the island to leave and could order a mandatory evacuation. At Georges Robidoux's house, the damage is already done. It's hard to have to leave, he says. It will take him weeks to repair and decontaminate once the water finally goes. It's a similar story for more than 100 other Quebec communities, with water levels higher than they've been in decades. We're now in historic level territory. And, it's, and it goes beyond the worst scenarios that have occurred in the last 55 years. So today, the province asked the military for help to try to limit the damage. We think it's very appropriate to ask for additional uh, resources, additional efforts from the armed forces. And I'm very happy that we, we had the entire collaboration of the federal government in this respect. Soldiers will soon be on the ground in areas like this, where after weeks of sandbagging and pumping water from their homes, exasperated residents are fed up. We're sick and tired, he says. We're not sleeping at night. And there will likely be more sleepless nights ahead because the rain keeps coming. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. I'm Judy Trin in a community along the Gatineau River. As you can see, the river has burst its banks, threatening a neighborhood with hundreds of homes. Besieged by floodwaters, this community resembles a watery ghost town. But city councillor Denis Tasse still encounters residents who are choosing to stay. Some people have cat, dogs, and uh, they, want, they want to stay in, in their home, you know. This couple waded through waist-high water to check on their house. As you can see. And found a lifetime of belongings floating in the basement. I know the freezer is uh, floating in the basement. We couldn't get the freezer out fast enough, so that's staying there and the rest of the bunch of stuff. We have, we have albums from uh, trips to Cuba, Mexico, stuff like that. That's floating everywhere in the basement. We couldn't, lost some memories. We, got, we lost a lot of memories. So far, more than 250 people have voluntarily left their homes, and Gatineau's emergency workers are still able to get to residents. But that could change. And in the capital, floodwaters from a raging Ottawa River threaten dozens of homes. 
bracing for the worst, city officials have set up two storm shelters for evacuees. Further east, the municipality of Clarence Rockland has declared a state of emergency and an army of volunteers have rushed in to help. See what's going on with these people and in all the other areas. You gotta try and do something. It's just total devastation. But back in Gatineau, sandbags seem futile. From his kayak, Pierre Sigmund can only gasp at the power of the elements. It's nature, uh, it, it controls us. It's not us that controls the nature. So. Yet Sigmund says he won't leave until he's left with no other choice. Judy Trin, CBC News, Gatineau. I'm Havard Gould in Toronto, a city that held its breath today, wondering whether it would lose an artery or two. The Don River surging and threatening to overflow, which would have closed a major highway and shut down a key commuter rail line. Well, we have a water level uh, that, uh, alarm that measures exactly how, how high the water is rising above sea level. And at, right at, at 79, it triggers the uh, alarm, and we're at uh, uh, 78 and a half now. So we're pretty close. It was close for hours. One solid downpour could have led to commuter chaos, but the city caught a break. And so the trains kept running and the traffic flowing through the evening rush hour. On Toronto's islands, home to some 700 residents, evacuation plans are ready. We are boaters. Uh, we are used to water. And a number of us have our boats in the water in case we, we need to use the boats. But so far, sandbags have held back the waves from the rising Lake Ontario. You want to make sure that the water levels don't get up any higher and the sandbags are meant to protect against some of the wave action. Less lucky, a neighborhood in Bowmanville, east of Toronto. Some three dozen homes are exposed to the waves coming off Lake Ontario. Only a massive effort has prevented disaster. We're a very tight-knit community, and um, every time somebody puts a call out for help, there's help. Um, without that, without that, this entire community would be underwater today. Across southern Ontario, officials are warning there are many rivers and streams that have suddenly become dangerous. The usually tame Humber River, just one. You wouldn't survive that. You'd never get out of that. It's keeping this tree in there. So. so while there is some relief, there is also a sense that the threat hasn't passed. Havard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. There has been so much rain causing so many problems. It has people asking, what's going on? Let's get some insight. Johanna Wagstaff is our senior meteorologist and she joins us from Vancouver. So Johanna, why is Central Canada getting so much rain right now? Well, Wendy, any rain at this point would be bad news for the flooded areas, but this really is a worst case scenario. This storm system has slid up from the south and basically stalled out over the Ontario Quebec border where it'll spin for the next couple of days. Now, a big reason why it has become stuck in such a bad location is the jet stream, that fast band of moving air in the upper atmosphere that normally carries systems west to east across the country. It's meandered so dramatically, it's in this blocking pattern. So our low pressure system has become stuck in one of these downward waves and that's where it'll sit as I take you through the weekend you can see it really doesn't move much we'll have to wait until early next week for the system to finally kick east but I have to say this is a scenario that climate change studies are looking more and more at these meandering jet streams becoming more common in fact a recent study just a few weeks ago shows these stalled out jet streams have increased by 70 percent since the industrial revolution but again hoping this one kicks out by early next week, Wendy. Well, we'll see about that. But now New Brunswick, we're hearing that it could be facing this level of rain or, or worse. Yes, that's right. Uh, the rains are just moving into New Brunswick tonight and actually intensifying. Now, part of that reason is this storm has become stuck in such a bad position, tapping into subtropical moisture from uh, the Caribbean islands. And that's where we're getting the worst of the rain over the next 24 hours in southwestern New Brunswick. That's where authorities have asked uh, or urged people living along the St. John River to prepare for flooding. We could be looking at over 100 millimeters of rain by the end of Sunday, really hoping for that break early next week for everyone, but it will be a very active next couple of days, Wendy. Thanks so much, Johanna. Johanna Wagstaff in Vancouver. Coming up, more and more apps offer help with mental health. Just because there's an app doesn't mean that you're getting quality therapy. 
We have tips to help you choose. Plus, London pubs are closing down. We find out why. Natalia Martinez is sleeping in a real bed tonight. The 37-year-old mountain climber was rescued by helicopter last night. She'd been trapped on Canada's highest mountain since Monday. Greg Rasmussen has the details. Spectacular scenery, but for the last few days, a prison of sorts for Natalia Martinez, a mountain climber from Argentina. Leading up to this, days of anxiety and detailed high-altitude rescue planning. Finally, there was a break in the weather, but it was late in the day, creating a race against fading daylight. Pleased to see us, of course, relieved, uh, cold, fatigued, um, very quiet. Martinez had been trapped since Monday after a pair of large earthquakes made the slopes around her unsafe. Then, fierce storms prevented her rescue. We had high snowfall, uh, in, particularly in um, Natalia's location, uh, and poor visibility, low cloud ceilings. Martinez was on a route not used by many climbers, a steep ascent followed by a long traverse. She was at more than 3,000 metres when the first earthquake hit. Alone in her tent, she feared the entire glacier was crumbling beneath her. I don't know, I can't take this. Okay. Her boyfriend, also an experienced mountaineer, has kept in touch by sat phone. He says at first she barely slept, fighting to protect her exposed camp from snow driven by winds over 100 kilometres an hour. She did everything uh, right, so she kept her camp safe and herself safe through the earthquake and through the storm and winds and low temperatures. After sleepless days and nights, he's now on his way to meet her. I saw some pictures of her smiling, so, and that was such a, a big relief for me. Rana says Martinez is quiet but tough, and although she texted him that she was scared, she was also disappointed she didn't reach this summit this time. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. The risk of avalanches in the Rockies remained high today, even raised to extreme in some places, and a stretch of highway near Jasper had to be closed overnight because of an avalanche. It happened when a Parks Canada crew set off a controlled avalanche near Lake Louise. Instead, it grew past the intended size, and a portion of the Icefields Parkway was buried under mounds of snow. No one was injured in the slide. Canada's never-ending arm wrestling match with the U.S. over trade got a little more intense today. A week after the Trump administration announced plans for duties on Canadian softwood lumber, it seems the Trudeau government is flexing its own muscles a little harder too. A little earlier, we spoke with the CBC's Katie Simpson in Ottawa. So, Katie, a little tit-for-tat here. What's expected? Well, Ottawa's retaliation strategy is still in the early stages, but it involves two key plans of attack. First, a possible ban on the shipment of thermal coal through ports in British Columbia. It's a shot aimed at U.S. coal producers who use those facilities and would be left scrambling to find another avenue to ship their product overseas. The Prime Minister says he is carefully and seriously considering this option at the request of B.C. Premier Christy Clark. Second, Canada is considering imposing special duties on certain products from Oregon. One of the state's senators has been seen as an agitator in the softwood lumber dispute. So Ottawa is looking to options to put duties on products from that state, including wine, plywood, wood chips and even packing materials. A little bit on timing. Why is this happening now? Well, voters in B.C. are going to the polls on Tuesday, and Trudeau's willingness to cooperate with Clark, Christy Clark, on this issue could give her a boost. As Premier so far, Clark has been very supportive of Trudeau and his pipeline plan, and that needs to, she needs that continued support if this plan is to ever become a reality. As for the bigger picture, Wendy, government officials today tell me that this is not meant to be seen as an attack on Donald Trump, but instead a consideration of targeted measures. Thanks so much, Katie. Katie Simpson in Ottawa tonight. The latest snapshot on Canadian jobs came out today. It shows the unemployment rate across the country went down just a touch, landing at 6.5% in April. That's the lowest it's been since the last major recession began in October 2008. Compare that overall number, though, to one particular age group, 55 and older, and the picture may surprise you. For them, the unemployment rate is even lower, just 5.6%. Jacqueline Hansen has more on that trend. Morgana Kelly retired in her late 60s, but she hasn't actually stopped working. I work uh, with standardized patient work and I work in, what else do I do? 
I volunteer in the place I live. I, I'm in community work. Kelly says she doesn't necessarily need the extra money, but it helps. Toronto, as we all know, is an extremely expensive city. So even if you have a good pension or retirement fees, it's very difficult to make it work. One of her jobs is a part-time position doing errands and visiting with other seniors. Whether it's taking them to the doctor. Seniors for Seniors is a company that pairs people who are 55 or older and want to work with other seniors who need extra help at home. They love that there's a company out there that gives the opportunity for seniors to be back in the workforce. And as baby boomers age, demand is going up. People just want to stay in their homes. So it's, it's a huge in, increase um, of clients and requests and inquiries that we're getting. Statistics Canada's latest labour force survey shows about one in eight seniors are active in the workforce. Over the past year, people aged 55 and up had the fastest rate of employment growth of any age group. And about half the total jobs created in Canada went to those workers. There is some concern that older people in the workforce could rob younger generations of opportunities. I don't perceive it to be a negative factor at all. TD's chief economist says for Canada as a whole, it can actually help. Because they're staying in the market, they're earning an income and they're spending and, and uh, taking vacations and all those wonderful things that go along with it. Canada's economy may benefit from having more hands on deck for now, but eventually even the most active baby boomers will retire. And it's the younger generations that will be left to drive the Canadian economy. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Straight ahead, B.C. Liberals recruit Indigenous candidates. It's stirring debate among First Nations voters. Fidel Castro, seen here with his brother Raul, has been a focal point of controversy ever since his Barbudos, his bearded gorillas, overthrew the Batista regime on New Year's Day this year. His executions of former enemies, his gentle handling of communists, his land reform program involving expropriation of large United States interests, all these things have kept him in the headlines. He was interviewed in Havana by CBC reporter Michael McClear. Like in Canada, we find support too in the public opinion. Last year, by far the sharpest thorn on the American side was Cuba. Raul Castro, the Minister of Defense, one of the most bitter enemies of the United States, his hatred of all things American surpassed only by that of his brother Fidel. Do you think that Canada should continue to trade with Cuba despite the United States embargo on trade with that country? I don't think we should let uh, the United States decision uh, not to trade with Cuba to influence us. I think we have to stick to the United States policy. I personally am against any trade with Cuba. Pierre Trudeau was the first leader of a Western industrial nation to step on Cuban soil, to be greeted with a warm and friendly double handshake by Fidel Castro, since Castro came out of the mountains, leading a revolution that started turning Cuba into a communist state in 1959. At a quick news conference, Trudeau was asked if he was concerned about the people back home who were shocked by his presence in a communist state. Well, the category of people which would be shocked by that have long since been shocked by my visit to China and uh, to the Soviet Union, so uh, I guess I can't worry about that. The Prime Minister arrived, Fidel Castro was there to greet him with a tirade about the United States. El bloqueo contra Cuba. Castro said the blockade is a calumny. He said it's genocide. The Prime Minister made no direct response to him. In his brief remarks, he talked of a new awareness in Cuba. An expression of confidence in the increasing openness of Cuba to the wider world. Most of these people couldn't tell you the name of the Canadian Prime Minister, but they know about Canada. Canada figures high up in their homes. Only two days until France's election, and there are allegations from the camp of frontrunner Emmanuel Macron 
that has been the victim of a coordinated hacking attack. Hundreds of its emails have been released, it says, as part of a misinformation campaign. That's just the latest similarity to last year's U.S. election, along with the rise of a populist candidate. Marine Le Pen and her rival were out today in a final push. Now Ayed is in Paris with more on that. There were probably easier ways to get a political message across on this last day of campaigning, but few perhaps as effective as choosing the Eiffel Tower as the backdrop. The Greenpeace stunt raised serious security concerns, all in the name of warning against the far right. If Marine Le Pen and the National Front come to power, there is every chance that these values will be chipped, damaged, restricted, says Greenpeace director Jean-François Julien. It's been a turbulent end for Le Pen's campaign. She was booed in the city of Reims. Yesterday, protesters tried to pelt her with eggs. But she insists, despite the polls, she will win, much like Donald Trump did. Victory is at hand, she says. The others, the media, have failed to understand the anger of the nation. An acerbic contest saw Emmanuel Macron fending off rumors repeated by Le Pen. He evaded taxes by hiding money in the Bahamas. He accused her of lying, of being the high priestess of fear. At his final rally, he called on voters to block the extreme right. No! No, don't boo, he says. It won't help. Go fight them. Go defeat them. Go vote against them. In the final dash of his improbable rise, centrist Macron has been endorsed by politicians, left and right, religious figures, and an international symbol of the political center. He appeals to people's hopes and not their fears. Upstart Macron and his year-old movement are reminiscent of Obama's sweep in 2008, says this Paris-based American advisor who has now worked on both their campaigns. If France elects an extreme right-wing anti-European president, um, it's the end of the European Union. Frankly, all of the values that I care about of tolerance and pluralism and um, freedom of thought and solidarity, um, they're at risk. They're at risk. If if Europe goes, I don't know who else is going to stand up for these values. If the polls are right and Macron wins Sunday, the political center can claim victory over populism for now, but not yet over the division and anger. Nal Ayed, CBC News, Paris. It's also the final push in the race to be the next leader of Canada's Conservative Party. The next three weeks are a time of divide and conquer. There are still 13 candidates, all trying to get out the vote any way they can. And as Susan Lund tells us, winning doesn't necessarily mean coming first. All right, guys, let's hope they're home. Volunteers aren't letting a little rain stop them from reaching out to supporters. Hi, I'm Jackie Cousins from the Andrew Shear campaign. The push is on to make sure people have received their ballots and they mail them in. Yeah, it's a two two horse race right now, and every vote is going to count. Joel? No. No. Candidates are out too, trying to convince people who are still undecided. I don't know, there's just so many candidates that it's it's kind of hard to just pin down, you know, my my top. Whoever. There's a few people that I know that I'm considering and there's some that I'm not, but I still think it's important to see everyone before you make a decision. The race opened up a bit last week when frontrunner Kevin O'Leary dropped out and threw his support behind Maxime Bernier. That left the other candidates like Kelly Leach scrambling to pick up some of his support. And I can tell you as the conservative alternative in this race, individuals are coming to vote for me in droves and it's exciting. No, 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 it is not in the bag, you know. Yeah. Bernier told reporters he has a lot of work to do, but he's hoping the majority of O'Leary supporters come to him. This former O'Leary backer says, don't assume anything. I would think some of them are upset that O'Leary left, so they may decide to say, well, you know, you've gone to Bernier, but, uh, and I'm upset with you because you left, I'm going to go elsewhere. Ayat has picked a new number one, but won't say whom. Just that he agrees with O'Leary that it must be someone who can beat Justin Trudeau in 2019. I like 
a lot of people, you know, but I don't think they make good leader. So I wouldn't necessarily vote for someone who m make a good leader, but not be Justin Trudeau. Conservatives can pick up to 10 choices on their ballot, and in a ranked system where it may take several ballots to win, those second and third choices are key. Party members have until the end of the day on May 26 to get their mail-in ballots into party headquarters, otherwise they have to find a polling station on May 27th, the same day the new leader will be announced. Susan Lunn, CBC News, Ottawa. As you heard earlier in the program, on Tuesday, people in British Columbia go to the polls, and there we could see a shift for Indigenous voters. They usually support the NDP, but the B.C. Liberals are hoping by recruiting some high-profile First Nations candidates, they could swing the vote their way. Chris Brown has more on that. How are you doing? Thanks for coming out the other day. Hey, Ellis. Welcome home. Thank Ellis you. Ross is on the leading edge of a striking trend. Yes, coming down to crunch time. He's a prominent First Nations leader trying to get elected on Premier Christy Clark's BC Liberal team. I think our values align closely with what the Liberals want to achieve. Next generation needs a future. As a Heisla chief, Ross was a pitchman for the liquefied natural gas industry and the thousands of jobs it could bring to BC's Northwest. The industry's been here for the last 60, 70 years. It was arguably the Clark government's signature project, but one that's taken a huge, perhaps even fatal hit. The collapse of world markets has meant the dream is on hold. Is it a frustration that we're here now and there's not more to show for it? That's that's putting it mildly. You know, Still, I, I the fact that the Liberals could recruit uh, Ross is significant and breaks with generations of tradition here. This part of BC has lots of First Nations voters who in the past have tended to support the New Democrats, but having Indigenous leaders running for the party in power that supports big industrial projects, that represents a seismic shift. We've learned hard as we're trying to build economies for First Nations communities. That On Vancouver Island, First Nations businessman Dallas Smith is a B.C. Liberal candidate. And so is Gitniao Deputy Chief Wanda Good. So we're going into the High Road Services Society. Who's campaigning in Smithers. I'm getting lots of good feedback, lots of good response from the community members here and within the First Nations communities that, that uh, have, have told me that, uh, that there is hope. Still, other prominent First Nations voices are encouraging Native people to vote for anyone but Christy Clark and her party. It does not represent the mainstream rank and file Indigenous interests throughout the entire province of British Columbia. Hi Alicia, how are you doing? Aboriginal voters can determine the outcome in many northern ridings, so it's a quandary for people like Carolyn Grant. We've always voted NDP. Now that Alice is in there, it does change a whole lot of things. This election, compelling voices are offering competing visions about the best party to push First Nations forward. Chris Brown, CBC News in Smithers, BC. Coming up, an incredibly brave Canadian is honoured at last. This is a person who was willing to give her life to stand up for what she believed in. Mona Parsons kept her cool as the Nazis sentenced her to death. But first, students in Manitoba race to find their high-flying experiment. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX increased 185 points. The dollar rose nearly two-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 55 points. The price of oil closed up 70 cents a barrel. A rapidly increasing number of experts and politicians are becoming progressively alarmed about air pollution. Most of the damage is caused by car pollution coming from the exhaust, and a bill has just been introduced in the Congress for a federal study of electric cars. The car uses no gas or oil, needs almost no maintenance, and creates no pollution or noise. Speed is a problem, though, for the car can only get up to 40 or 50 miles an hour. It doesn't look like much but under its homemade plywood body is an efficient zinc air battery powered electric motor. In its present experimental form, the car has a top speed of 73 miles per hour and a cruising range of more than 300 miles. It takes eight hours to recharge the battery from an ordinary household electrical outlet. The owner is 61-year-old Bill Ward. I asked him if he's had any approaches from manufacturers. 
Not genuine approaches, no. General Motors says it has made a breakthrough in the development of batteries to power the electric car of the future. Zinc nickel oxide batteries drive the car for 160 kilometers before they need recharging. That's twice as far as conventional battery power. The motorist simply plugs his car in overnight to build the power back up again. This type of electric car gets a top speed of 80 kilometers an hour and would cost about the same as a standard subcompact model. It may look like an ordinary Chrysler van on the outside, but it's a very different van on the inside. It uses an electrically powered sodium sulfur battery. The electric van was unveiled last week at Expo in Vancouver. Powerplex calculates that electricity for its battery costs about one and a half cents a kilometer, compared to five and a half cents for gasoline. It's becoming almost a ritual in the automotive industry now. A car company puts on a big PR show for its new electric car. Everyone says how wonderful electric cars are, and then they tell you that you can't buy one even if you wanted to, because it just doesn't make economic sense. Experts say improvements in technology will eventually make electric cars practical, but it's slow going, just like Vancouver traffic. There's gold fever on the streets of St. Paul. Everyone's talking about Briex, a small Calgary mining company that struck gold half a world away. And even though the mines are in Indonesia, a lot of the wealth is right here in St. Paul. So do you know any new millionaires? A few. Traders at the Alberta Stock Exchange say they've never seen anything like it. From a low of $1.90 to a high of $170 in just one year. Just five weeks ago, Briex's exploration chief predicted the mine could yield up to 200 million ounces of gold. But last week, the first signs of potential trouble. Briex geologist Michael de Guzman fell from a helicopter on a flight to the mining site. Some say it was suicide. Now the Indonesian government has put the project on hold after Briex revealed yesterday the size of the find may have been overstated. Wholesale panic today over the Briex affair. Canadians dumped the gold company's stock as fast as they could. Share prices crashed and Briex struggled in vain to stop the damage. All this after word the company's supposedly gigantic gold strike could be worthless. Security guards have been patrolling the building since early last night when the company released the independent audit by Strathcona Minerals, calling Briex the largest fraud in international mining history. Briex employees continued to work even as the world speculated about how such a massive salting scheme could have been carried out. The Wall Street Journal ran a front page story talking about a secret storage site where workers added mysterious powders to already crushed rock before sending it on to the assay labs. These are pictures of that alleged site. The sign says if you have no business here, go away. Around 400 million in market capitalization has been lost in the first four minutes of trading. That money's gone. It can be hard for people facing mental health challenges to reach out for support. Now, help is closer than ever, with more and more apps just to tap away on our phones. But that can be a problem, too. With thousands of apps to choose from, it's hard to know which ones to pick and whether they work. Christine Barak has more. Think of it like a gym membership for the mind. Thousands of mental health apps offering quick, easy self-help. Find your calm, happiness, peace of mind. It's pocket psychology at your service. Tackling social fears, there we go. Diana Aquata lives with anxiety and depression. She was on a wait list for three years to see a counselor. She now uses apps to help her cope with everyday stresses. I pretty much put my mood and how I'm feeling into the app and then it just pops up a bunch of recommendations. Quick, cheap advice, but do those recommendations really benefit your mental health? And how can you tell? I think it definitely is a wild west. I think there's, like anything in the wild west, there's a lot of potential, there's definitely gold, but there's a lot of, you could almost say digital snake oil too, and separating out those two right now is it's difficult. Difficult, but not impossible. Researchers say before you download, make sure there's a privacy policy. The price of a free mental health app may be the sale of your personal health information. Is the app based on an idea or evidence? In other words, did the maker do clinical trials to test how well it works? If yes, ask yourself, 
Will I really use this long term? Results take time. And finally, find out if the data you produce can be given to your family doctor or health team to be integrated into your overall care. Let the buyer beware. But doctors aren't counting apps out. In fact, hospitals are coming up with their own digital services, giving patients online access to therapies they might otherwise wait years for. For instance, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is as evidence-based for mild and moderate depression as pills. Apuata sees her app as a tool, not a cure-all. If I'm stressed out, maybe I can exercise. Like, I don't necessarily have to use the app. Experts insist that while mental health apps can be helpful, anyone can create an app. So without evidence that it works, it's like taking advice from a stranger. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. On a tarmac in Switzerland, a baby step towards renewable transportation took off. This is the maiden flight for a sun-powered plane made by Solar Stratus. It only lasted eight minutes and went 300 meters. Not impressive, especially if you remember Solar Imp Impulse, a plane that flew around the world on solar power. But this prototype is smaller, carries more weight, and intends to go higher towards the edge of space. Reaching toward those heavenly heights is a thrill for anyone. Some Manitoba high school students are over the moon after their own ambitious launch. Cameron McIntosh was there to capture the excitement. Let's try one more time, guys. This isn't your typical yep. high school science project. And is it lifting? One weather balloon yeah. and a space probe made out of salad bowls. And you're flying two salad bowls into space? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's exactly what we're doing. For school? For school, yep. Yes. For science. Winnipeg's Garden City Collegiate is one of a handful of Canadian schools participating in the Global Space Balloon Challenge. Students design experiments, then launch them into the upper stratosphere. We're sending up um, UV and ozone sensors, and we're also sending up some DNA, and um, we're going to see how the ozone and UV affected the DNA. Along for the ride, one durable Lego gopher, the project mascot. Three, two, one, go for space! With a bit of a bump, off it goes. Spinning and rising high above southern Manitoba, taking the gopher with it, eventually to an altitude of 30 kilometers. That's three times higher than a jetliner, the edge of the ozone layer. Technically, it's still well below the 100 kilometer barrier of space, but it's high enough that the sky is black. It's a cool integration of science, but I mean, how closer to space flight can you get in a, in a school? On the ground, meanwhile, it turns out it's not all systems go. The probe's tracking signal is failing. Do you know where your balloon is? No. <laughs> no. Computer no. models tell them where it should be, but up at 30 kilometers, the pressure in the balloon becomes greater than the thinning atmosphere. What goes up must come down, fast. It takes a good hour of gopher dizzying falling but it starts to slow in the thicker atmosphere. And finally, 160 kilometers from the launch site, the gopher has landed. We got a spot. Yes, we got a spot. Just south of Low Farm. Just the probe starts transmitting a signal. The team goes out to find it. I don't see any drag marks. Okay. It's awesome. My this costs $12. It's very That's a exciting. Lot. Feels uh, quite good. Uh, I, thought, uh, I thought the payload would actually like Split open. That's they still have plenty of work to do, analyzing their data and experiments, but as far as reaching for the edge of space, mission accomplished. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, near Low Farm, Manitoba. Oh, there goes Adam. So cool. Up next, a Canadian woman who stood up to Nazi injustice. She's finally being honored for her unflinching bravery. The people of Thomasville, Georgia, have stopped counting how often it comes. They just know it does. It's that train, the one carrying the most galling of cargoes. Canadian softwood lumber, Newfoundland, Quebec, British Columbia's best. Each plank more salt in the very deep wound of Bob Balfour. Well, it doesn't feel very good to see the tracks fill with Canadian lumber. We know it's overwhelming the country. In that rail yard shadow, three generations of Bob Balfour's have cut southern pine here. But the mill's been silent for months, 
No match, the argument goes, for Canada. We know it's taking our markets away from us. They can undersell uh, southern yellow pine all over the United States. There's no way that we can compete with Canada. Here, in the land of the southern pine, that's a little hard to take. Georgia is the largest lumber products manufacturer in the entire United States, but that doesn't mean its own southern pine rules this place. Canadian softwood, this lumber right here, now takes a third of the market. Ideal for the construction industry, Canadian softwood is lighter, easier to pound nails into, cheaper. And that's always frustrated the U.S. mill owners. Decades of trade battles were supposed to end with a deal negotiated in 1996 that restricts the export of Canadian softwood lumber. U.S. mill owners say it didn't protect them enough, point out that three major Georgia mills have closed in the last year. Many more, like Metcalf Lumber, are on the brink. Limping along, the owner says, in hope that when the current agreement ends on March 31st, something stricter will replace it. Canadians want just the opposite, complete free trade in softwood. That makes P.W. Bryant I shudder. I think the situation only worsens. Yeah, probably we'll, we'll have to shut down. Canadian mills are suffering too, but there's a perception here that Canada has an unbeatable edge. Partly because of the low Canadian dollar, partly because many Canadian mills are more modern, more efficient. But the most unfair advantage, say the Americans, is how little Canadians pay for timber. Where U.S. mills must bid for wood on the open market, Canadians buy it from government-owned land at much cheaper prices. An illegal subsidy, the Americans scream. Don't bother trying to remind anyone here that that's never been proven. I don't think they're as justified as our plight. I'm telling you, the lumber industry in the United States is in dire straits. I mean, they, this is the worst. I've been in it 40 years, and I've never seen it like this. Complex trade issues that deep in the southern woods boil down to one clear reality. It's really hurt our business. You know, I don't have any problem with them shipping it in here, but they should tax it accordingly. An entire industry on the edge. Convinced Canada is driving it into oblivion. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Thomasville, Georgia. She never wore a uniform, never carried a gun, and she was willing to just work by her wits and do whatever was necessary. Her name was Mona Parsons, a Canadian from Wolfville, Nova Scotia, who was the most unlikely of war heroes. Her story has long been buried in the pages of history, but today she got a long overdue tribute, and we'll tell you about that in a moment. But first, we want to remind you of this woman's grit and spirit. Here's the CBC's Red Sharon with a story we originally brought you in November of 2015. What you should know about Mona. In a quiet place in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, down the road past Acadia University, inside Willowbank Cemetery, you can find Mona Parsons' grave. Wife of Major General W.H. Foster is all it says. But as you're about to find out, the lady who's resting here was really so much more than that. But you can see the, the German stamp on the back, so this would have been sent after the occupation. Because by her own admission, by writer and biographer Andrea Hill Lair is a little obsessed with Mona Parsons' story. A journey that began over a decade ago with a chance finding in the Acadia University Bulletin, a passing reference to a former student who had been sentenced to death by a Nazi court. I went and asked questions and, you know, people had bits and pieces of the story, bits and pieces that were tantalizing enough that this was a, almost a larger than life character. And so that began the search. Began the journey, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Mona Parsons was born in the Annapolis Valley in 1901. 
the daughter of store owner and successful businessman Norval Parsons. During World War I, both he and his son served, coming home to find Mona, the baby of the family, had grown into a beautiful young woman. A woman who usually got what she wanted. And what she wanted was to be a star. She headed to New York City and talked her way into one of the biggest shows in town. The story goes, she saw Florence Ziegfeld in a restaurant in New York and asked him for an audition and he had a, an eye for a lovely face and a nice voice and a nicely turned ankle and she got it and became a, a chorus girl for the Ziegfeld, the Ziegfeld Follies. Follies. But after her mother died, Mona turned to a more serious career, nursing working in a Park Avenue practice and still enjoying big city life, when her brother asked her to show a young Dutch millionaire a business acquaintance around town. Willem Leonard was smitten. This woman was vivacious and outgoing and loved to dance and, and party. And He was in love. And he was in love. In August 1937, they sailed for Holland, marrying shortly after building their large dream home and becoming part of the in crowd among the young Dutch high society. It looked like Cinderella had met her Prince Charming and all they had to do was live happily ever after. All that changed in just five short days in 1940. That was all it took for the German war machine to roll in and occupy Holland. Willem wanted his new bride to leave. Mona would not. She was very proud of her, her Canadian background, but she was also very proud to be a Dutch citizen and, and took it very seriously. And she felt that her place was there for the duration of the war come what may. Doing what she could. Do. Doing what she could. Mona and her husband would not bow down. They would resist, building a secret compartment in their home, hiding Allied airmen who had been shot down over the Dutch countryside, helping them find their way to the coast and British submarines waiting offshore. They had people who were arrested, people who were part of the network, and of course things would come to a standstill. And so that they, person they knew would be they released. were. In, this was a dangerous thing yeah. to be doing. Yeah, they yeah. they understood the risks. I don't think they anticipated getting caught but a Nazi sympathizer had infiltrated their cell. The Gestapo sprung their trap. Willem temporarily escaped. Mona was arrested. It did not go well. She is sentenced to death. It was when she heard uh, the death sentence that she stood and took it very calmly and so impressed the, the head of the tribunal because she um, apparently clicked her heels together, nodded her head and said, Guten Morgen, meine Herren, and turned to be led from the courtroom. And when she was taken out, the head of the tribunal met her outside and said that she so impressed them with her calm, cool demeanor that she would be permitted to appeal, and she did. And she, her life sentence was, she was commuted to a life sentence at hard labor. What followed was years of imprisonment across Germany, dealing with sickness and starvation. She had night sweats, frequent vomiting, diarrhea, um, and lost a lot of weight. I think she said something about 90 pounds, but by the end of the war, she weighed only 87 pounds. But in 1945, the Allies gained the upper hand. Bombs dropped across Germany, including on the small airfield near her prison. In the confusion, Mona and a friend managed to escape, walking across Germany, evading capture until finally linking up with the troops liberating Holland. They thought she was a German spy. Collaborators were having their heads shaved in public. She said no, she was from Wolfville, Nova Scotia. The troops were the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. Some of them even knew her. But how amazing is that? I know. It's since I'm living in Nova Scotia, I have learned that the six degrees of separation are actually more like one or two, you know, and that really is a, is a story that underscores that. Soon after the war, Willem, who had also survived but was very weak, died. Family disputes left the fortune in ruins. 
Mona took a few prized possessions and returned to Nova Scotia. She married an old school chum, Major General Harry Foster, and when he passed, lived a quiet life in Wolfville until her death in 1976. Look at the change in her handwriting. Andrea Hill Lair has collected so many pieces of Mona's life, her handwritten notebooks, photographs, even the citations for bravery she received, not only from the British, but also from American President Eisenhower. But in Canada, Mona Parsons was refused a pension, denied even a medal for those who served but did not wear a uniform, and has never been officially recognized by the Canadian government. This is a person who was willing to give her life to stand up for what she believed in, in justice and in freedom, very nearly forfeit that life, and yet has received no recognition whatsoever. So here we go. Oh yes, you can see the, the long journey is over. But there is still one last effort to recognize Mona, the hope is to turn sculptor Nistel Bremdebor's portrayal of Mona, dancing on the day of her release, into bronze. And that's the one she's kicking off. Yes. In enjoy. glee. <laughs> enjoy, yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. Dutch himself, his parents too survived the German occupation. Well, the whole story is, is very, very close. A real honor yeah. for you to recognize her in this way. That's right, that's right. Right in the middle of town. That one right there, yeah. The dream, if fundraising is successful, is to have her on Main Street dancing. It's going to be quite a moment. It will. <laughs> she never wore a uniform, never carried a gun, and she was willing to just work by her wits and do whatever was necessary. Put her life on the line. And put her life on the line, and very nearly lost it. If you ever find yourself in the Annapolis Valley, near the Willowbank Cemetery, take a moment to remember Mona Parsons. That's what I need. Officially recognized or not, by all accounts, a true Canadian hero. Red Sharon, CBC News, in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Today, Mona got her moment and a lasting tribute in Wolfville. That bronze statue, the one of Mona dancing, was unveiled in the center of town, and of course, Hilaire was there. She's much too young. I don't know that there are enough words in the English language. I mean, I'm not even sure that you're going to be able to see me because I'm vibrating, you know, just with absolute sheer joy. It's almost too much to bear. Incidentally, today is the 72nd anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands. When we come back, last call in London. Why so many traditional pubs are closing for good. Each working day of the year throughout Canada, the post office handles about 10 million pieces of mail. The men who face the gigantic task of sorting this mass of mail must know the names of 13,000 cities, towns and villages in Canada. In the last decade, its reputation for quick, dependable service has been smashed by literally hundreds of labor disturbances. Its deficit has risen to an astonishing $600 million a year, and its automation program is so far behind schedule, no one can estimate when it'll be finished. Canadians are losing patience. They're increasingly fed up, and so am I. The post office will become a crown corporation. In rural communities across Canada, the post office is more than a place to buy stamps and pick up your mail, and this one is no exception. It's really the center of the village. But Canada Post says it loses money. These new super boxes will replace Verna Dunlop. There's no contact with an, uh, an aluminum box and a key. We want to have a community life. About 30 groups of angry residents from across Canada kicked off a national campaign today to get rid of super mailboxes. Ann Derrett lives in Markham, just north of Toronto. She doesn't get home mail delivery. Every weekday, either she or her husband trudges about 100 meters to the neighborhood mailbox. Derrett hates that trek so much, she helped found RAM residents against mailboxes. Ram Mulrooney mailboxes. 
Well, the post office delivered something today it hasn't been able to for 30 years, a profit. Canada Post says it made almost $100 million in the past year, and it expects even bigger profits in the future. Canadians are making fewer trips to the mailbox. This is the main culprit, email, now as mainstream as a Hollywood blockbuster movie. Convincing the millions of Canadians who use it to come back to so-called snail mail won't be easy. Why would I want to mail a letter and post it and go to the mail to the mailbox? Why? Big change for many Canadians. The end of home mail delivery in urban centers. On doorsteps across the country today, there came plenty of reaction to the big changes at Canada Post. I like to have things delivered and everyone cuts back and it's so silly. Like the milkman a generation or more ago, the days of daily visits from your friendly letter carrier will soon seem like a quaint notion from another era. The National. The National. Tonight. I'm Pascal Hutton from When Calls the Heart, and you are watching CBC. We'll see you next summer. This next story involves beer and news that may leave you crying in yours. Britain's traditional pubs are shutting down at a staggering rate. The CBC's Thomas Dagla explains why it's closing time. It's been said London has a pub on every corner. Well, just about. Drawing crowds noon and night for a quick pint or sometimes to quench a bigger thirst. I think it's definitely an English culture, like just kind of like go to the pub, like it's easy to say what you're doing, let's go to the pub. It's just part and parcel of who we are, I think, as a, as a people. A ubiquitous sight that's slowly but surely fading from the landscape. Like here at the China Hall Public House, the pictures on the wall reflect only a small part of the 300 year history. A classic British pub facing closure at the end of the month. And they want to bring the uh, lease to a close and basically they just want to get rid of us. For 34 years, Michael and Linda Norris have run the place and lived upstairs. Their daughter Carrie pours the pints now, but all could be forced out as developers double the lease price. New people that are coming in and buying the, these sort of places, they're not going out drinking. Basically there won't be anything left. That's the way I think it's going. Plenty of other London pubs have been boarded up too. City Hall says a whopping 1,220 have closed since 2001. That leaves London with 25% fewer pubs, victims of drastic rent increases and a change in culture. Costs have gone up and that old British habit of popping in for a pint just isn't as popular as it once was, says this campaigner. You could say that uh, cheap Alcoholic drinks in supermarkets are a number one threat. You could say it's because fewer people go to pubs, but it's all linked up. A new government bill would give pubs special status, making it harder for the land to be redeveloped. London officials are vowing to better track pub closures, acknowledging those watering holes are too iconic to lose. Along with, you know, the, the, the red buses and the black caps, uh, they're incredibly important for our community uh, and they're incredibly important in terms of culture and for our economy as well. British land's about 5.30. Back at China Hall, a familiar face has stopped by to say hi. Patrick Ford, a regular customer turned friend. A sign of how a pub can be more than a pub, the centre of a community. Obviously all things uh, take their you know, progression, but this just seems to be unfair. Habits change and so does the landscape. Soon this place could be just another memory on the wall. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, London. 
And that's The National for this Friday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.